And another point, why do we give our heart to people in love? Why is the heart the symbol of love all over the world, see? You don't even have to say the word. You just draw a heart, and you know it was. Like, what are these, right? You're just like, oh, love, I, I love you. And like, everybody knows, you know? I go to many countries, and say I go to Russia, you know, and I can't read Russian, you know, and they don't even use common letters, you know. They use this other alphabet, right? So I see some word. I have no idea what it is. Then I see a heart. And then I see on the other side of the heart another word. I have no idea, but I know what it is. See, Sergey loves Anya. <laughs> Simple story. I, I know. You know. Why is the heart the universal symbol of love? Because we, the spirit soul, are located within the heart, inside the body. See, that's where we live. That's why all these things are right here, see? When someone breaks our heart, what does that mean? If the surgeon, oh, I'm dying from a broken heart. The surgeon cuts you open, looks, nothing wrong with your heart. I don't see any tears, any wounds. See, things working fine, you know? No, I got a broken heart, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, you know? Oh, see? Heartbreak Hotel, all those things. Right? Because the soul is in the heart. So all those feelings are right here. These emotions, these feelings of love are right here. See? When you break up with somebody, you say, oh, they broke my heart. You don't say, oh, they broke my foot. <laughs> Unless you kicked them as you went out the door, you see? <laughs> So that's another lesson for tonight. We, the spirit soul, are in the heart. Now, we, the spirit soul, need love. We don't need lust. Lust is our enemy. Love is our dear most friend. Bhagavad Gita, which is the main Vedic text that we study in the Bhakti Yoga system, it's an amazing work, and it explains everything so clearly. So in Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Lord talks about lust. He also talks a lot about love. But since we're dealing with lust in this world, let's have a closer look. He describes where lust comes from. From contemplation of the objects of the senses brings attachment. See, I think about something, but we'll just talk about people, all right? So I'm thinking about another person. I contemplate that person, see. Oh, they're so attractive. I like them, they're so sweet. I'm, I, you know, I, I want to be with that person. Hmm? Contemplation of the object of the senses brings attachment. I become attached to the person. Just the idea, I'm already attached. I want this. From attachment comes lust. Now, I'm in the condition of lust. It's not that I would like, to, I want, I need, I will get that person. Lust is very powerful. Now he continues with the story. From lust comes anger. You ever notice in the most loving relationships you have the most anger? The one you love the most is the one you hate the most. See, I love you, I hate you. You see, I love you, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> I loved her, I killed her. <laughs> I just read a report, this is interesting. You know, it said that the most dangerous place for a woman today is in the home. In the home? Isn't that where love is? Isn't that where the hearts and flowers are and the violins play and, you know, everybody's just feeling bliss? See? No, it's not. <laughs> Because it's not love in the home, it's lust. And when, you know, the, the good times are over, see, the honeymoon's over kind of thing, you know, then the anger comes. As long as everybody's enjoying the, the, the sensual pleasures, the things that I'm getting, whether they're physical or emotional or whatever level it's on or all that, you know, then everything's good, see? 
But when that runs out and lust never satisfies, see, it used to satisfy me, but it's beginning to diminish. It doesn't satisfy me like it used to, you know, and then it becomes less and less, and then anger, you see. We get into a relationship, and the responsibility of the other person is to make me happy. That's the responsibility automatic replace on the other person. Your position in this relationship is to make me happy. That's lost. They may even try, 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 but they cannot ultimately make us happy. So out of that comes anger. The world is so angry today, see? Whether it's personally in the home, or whether it's in business, or whether it's in political things, or nations against nations, and on and on it goes. See, all this conflict in the world today is because people are not happy. Do you think people as a nation or as a society of the planet were happy that would be all this conflict? You think people would be hating each other and shooting each other and, you know, exploiting each other and so on if they were happy? They wouldn't be, I can tell you, in case you don't know. <laughs> I'm helping you guys with the quiz. <laughs> oh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> no, it's a sign that there's a big, big problem. And the big problem is no love. That's the problem. If everybody was loving everybody, there'd be none of this conflict. There'd be none of these wars. See, it'd be a, a giving society, not a taking society. And with, when we don't have love, we're not happy, we're not fulfilled inside, so what's the next destructive thing that happens? Consume everything you can. Just gobble it up to try to be happy, you see. The senses are the avenues of happening for the body and the mind. So what? We think with the body and the mind, we think if we make our senses happy, see, we satisfy the eyes and the ears and the nose and the tongue and the genital and all those organs of pleasure, see, and, and the mind gets totally involved and anticipates and experiences and, you know, talks about and has memories of all this, then we'll be happy. See, that's the illusion. This is the mirage we're chasing, see. But it doesn't make us happy. I'm spirit soul. All those bodily, physical, mental, emotional, sentimental pleasures don't make me, the spirit soul, happy. So what happens? I have to have that happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction, love. That's a requirement of the soul. So what do I do? In illusion that I'm the body, I just consume more. I need more things. So as we consume more, this more comes from the planet, right? So we're destroying the planet. Consumerism is the problem, see? It's not too many people, it's too many empty people trying to fill themselves up with material things, see? So we're just gobbling up everything, like Pac-Man. You remember that game, Pac-Man? He just went to eat up everything. <laughs> well, there we are, we're just eating up everything, including each other, you know? We're angry, we're overindulging in everything, trying to be happy, and nobody's achieving the goal, see? So we get more frustrated, we get more angry. You know, from anger comes the continuation. From contemplation of the objects of the senses becomes attachment, from attachment comes loss, loss comes anger. Anger comes bewilderment of memory, loss of intelligence, see? We're completely stupid, we lose our intelligence, we do things we would never do, we say things we would never say. Emotions come up that we don't even know we have. We want to hurt people. We never wanted to hurt anybody before. Now we want to kill people. You know, verbally we, we try our best to damage that person. See, make them suffer because I'm suffering. They're not providing me with what I wanted. So therefore, they're my object of wrath. So what does it say in Bhagavad Gita by the Supreme Lord? He says, it is the all-devouring enemy of the world. It is stated very clearly, lust is the all-devouring enemy of the world. It is born of contact with the modes of passion. It's never satisfied and is the all-devouring enemy of the world. We think our enemy is this group of people and that group of people or this nation or that race or, you know, whatever. You know, we've, we've got a, all kind of enemies around. Mm -hmm. The real enemy is lust. 
It's not any and all of those things. We're just projecting that feeling on all of these other entities, whatever they are, see. But it's not that, see. It's lust. Lust is the all-devouring, sinful enemy of the world. On the other side, lust is the all-nourishing, wonderful friend and life-sustaining personality of the world. Yeah, that's what it sustains us. Without love, we don't have anything. So, therefore, we have to find it. But we don't have to find it. We just have to uncover it. Because remember, it's in the heart. It's already there. It's who we are. We are loving entities. See? You can't not love, but you can love. It goes through the false ego, becomes perverted, and then it's lost. So what is the trick here? What is the secret? Remove the false ego. That's the problem. You remove the false ego, and now there's no illusion. Now I understand who I am. Number one, I'm spirit soul. Now, that's the beginning of self-realization. We hear sometimes today a lot about self-realization. See, there's many levels of self-realization. The beginning, root, absolute, ground floor level is I am spirit soul. I am not this material body. That's the beginning of life. Now, from there, it goes higher and higher. Mm -hmm. Some people think, oh, we are everything. See, I am spirit. I am everything. See? Well, we're not everything. You know, we're still that tiny little spark. I can't grow, says the soul is changeless. I can't grow up into a big soul. See? I can't just, and now I'm bigger you. <laughs> we're all the same size eternally. On the spiritual level, we're all equal. See? We hear about equality. We everybody know that would be a good thing. See, and people have tried to achieve it with whole political systems. You see, like, you know, communism. We're all equal. See, they're trying to make it on a material level. Okay, you've got all the same amount of money, you've got the same kind of house, you've got the same food, you wear the same clothes, you got the same this and the same that. We're all equal. See, that's communism. Capitalism, we'll get the most. <laughs> Would be the most on it, the most I can get. I'm better than, see? But neither one works because we're trying to solve it from a material source. So communism, we're all equal, all had the same thing materially. That doesn't work. Capitalism, get as much as you can. The more you get, that more happy you'll be. That doesn't work either. See, both are failing systems. They can't work because I'm the spirit soul. See, I need the essence of life, love. Mm -hmm. The problem is the false ego, see? I'm not the body, I'm not the mind. This world is not my home. I belong in the spiritual world. We learn from our Vedic teaching, there's two worlds, see? There's the material world, we're in it now. We're covered in material bodies. We have material illusions, and on and on it goes. Material consciousness, we'll call it, see? But that is an impure, contaminated consciousness. In the pure, uncontaminated consciousness, again, it begins, I'm spirit soul. I'm a part and parcel of the supreme soul, see? If we go to higher levels of truth, which we must do to be fully happy, we'll understand there is a supreme soul. I am not the supreme soul, but there is a supreme soul. I can never become the supreme soul. Many yoga teachings today, you know, very popular ones, people are gravitating toward these ideas that I can become the supreme. I really am, but I haven't realized it, see. But if I become realized, I realize I'm supreme. That's not true. There is a supreme already, supreme personality. I am subordinate, but that's okay. You see, in the material world, oh, subordinate, I don't like that. I want to be number one, see. But we're not number one. There's already a number one. Our happiness is in not being number one. <laughs> See, we're trying to play to be a game we can't achieve. We're trying to be someone that we can't be. I'm not number one. See, there is already a number one. I am subordinate eternally 
to the Supreme Lord. My function, what is my function? See, as a spirit soul. In the material world, in our material identities, we have so many different functions. See, according to our positions in material situations, okay, I'm a husband. Okay, I have a function. I'm a wife. I have a function. I'm a mother. Okay, I have a function. I'm a child. I have a function. I work in this job. My boss says, your function is this. You see, and so on and so on it goes. As a citizen of Canada, you have a function. As whatever, whatever. Everybody's got a function according to their material position. We don't always uphold that, you see, but, you know, we have it. All right? So... That's okay for the material situation, but what about me, the spirit soul? What is my function? You see, my function is to serve the supreme person. See, serve, but not serving out of servitude. See, when we hear the word service, especially now as we advance more and more in our material consciousness, trying more to more to be number one with our advanced science and our advanced ability to control nature more and more, it seems like we're controlling nature. We're not, but that's part of the illusion. See, I can make things and do things and change things and create things and so on. So anyway, as we're advancing in this material consciousness, you see, using our abilities that are given to us by the Supreme Lord for spiritual realization, we're using them for material gain. But anyway, as we're moving in this direction, you see, trying to be number one, we're going further and further away from the goal, you see. So now, if we hear, I'm supposed to be subservient, it's, it's like harsh on our ears. It's like words I don't want to know. It's like a position I will not accept. You see, as we move further away from the truth. When a person wants to really solve the problem of life, he has to come off his pedestal of I am the Lord and come down to who he really is. I'm the eternal servant of the supreme soul, see. And that is the key, that is the secret, loving servant. I am the loving servant, not the servant. Like in the material world, that word is like, Oh, I don't want to be that, see. Master, hmm, I like that servant. Hmm, no, see. That's not servant as I'm speaking of servant. That's not a loving servant, but really by nature the soul is a servant. You can't get away from that. In the material world, we're trying to deny who we really are. But uniquely enough, because that's who we really are, servant by nature, we wind up serving anyway. The husband serves the wife, the wife serves the husband, the children's, the parents serve the child, the child sometimes serves the parents. <laughs> you see, the politician serves the constituents, the shopkeeper serves the customer, mm? the dog serves the master, but the master serves the dog. See, you ever notice that? You know, the big master say, I'm the guy, I'm the human, this is just my dog, you know, I can control my dog. Look, I can make him roll over, roll over, he rolls over. Sit up, he sits up, shake hands, he shakes hands. You know. See, I'm master, you see. So here's this guy, he's very proud of his lordship over his dog, you see. Next morning, it's minus 20, a little bit of wind, slight snow, and I'm out walking around, doing my meditation. I see this same master, out walking his dog, see, and he's got a little poop bag just waiting for the dog to relieve himself. He runs over, picks up his warm little goodie, puts it in his bag, and makes a little nice knot, and just carries it around like it's a gym, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, he found the treasure. <laughs> Who's serving who here? You know? You can't get away from being a servant. That's who you are by nature. And the more we resist it, the more frustrated we become. See, The further you get away from your true nature, the more frustrated you become. You're working against the grain, as they say. See, And it never produces a good fruit. So out of that, we get angry. You see, We get frustrated. And on and on it goes. Ill fruits. If we come to reality, if we just accept who we really are by nature, see, I am the eternal servant of the Supreme Lord. Aha! Now we at least are acknowledging who I, we really are, you see. Now at least philosophically, I am on the right page. 
and gradually I can follow the process of bhakti yoga, which makes it so not only do I accept it mentally and philosophically, and, but now I begin to engage in activity that brings this to a reality. And out of this, I experience more and more real love. 